Good morning, church. If you serve a good God, say amen. 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 We serve a great God, and we're glad that you're here with us. We're glad that if you're visiting with us, whether or not this is your first time, whether or not you're traveling, whether or not this is your 50th time visiting with us, we're glad that you're here, and we're glad that you uh, took time to be a part of our worship service this morning. Just uh, a little bit of housekeeping in the sense of what we just finished uh, a part of our parable series uh, last week. We have one more part of that parable series. Uh, we will deal with that uh, in the coming months as we'll go into that again. Next week, we are actually going to begin a series of lessons about the Holy Spirit. So uh, I know that many times we talk a lot about Jesus and we talk a lot about God. Uh, and sometimes the Holy Spirit gets lost because there's some mystery surrounding the Holy Spirit. Uh, this is not, shouldn't be a news flash to us that are Christians, but it's supposed to be that way. Okay? And, uh, but we're going to begin that series next week, and we'll begin a, a series of lessons really talking about the Spirit's role in the church and in our lives. And I hope that you'll make plans to be here and be a part of, of that with us. We're going to do uh, just a kind of a one off sermon this morning. Uh, it won't be part of a series, but, uh, and, I come to lessons like this, and I think they're really important for us as a church. And I think they're really important for us as a church specifically, because we are a multicultural church. And uh, we don't stray away from that, we don't hide that, we celebrate that. Uh, and we want to be people who celebrate about that. But... As a part of that, we also realize that we have to talk about issues and things that sometimes revolve around race and culture. And, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm a white dude, okay? Uh, newsflash for everybody, right? Uh, and, uh, uh, thank you, oh, really? Uh, I sometimes jokingly say that, that God really wanted me to go preach in a black church because I really, you know, I love preaching for black congregations. And, and uh, but, uh, you know, we've got to deal with these things. And I, I want us to, be, I want to lead in these discussions, but I also don't want to ever come across when we talk about these sort of things as someone who has it all figured out. Uh, I don't. When I come into lessons like this, I think it's important to open up this dialogue that we have sometimes about issues surrounding this. But also, I also understand that sometimes I may misspeak. I may not say things just right. Uh, I sometimes ask you for this. I'm, I'm asking for pre-forgiveness if that happens today. Uh, I want you to know that my heart is, is in leading us in good dialogue here. Uh, and we're really not going to deal directly with racial issues today, but it's definitely something that has stoked the fires. Uh, September 6, 2018, uh, many of you will remember... Uh, may not remember the day, but you'll remember what happened with Botham Jean. Botham Jean is a, was a student just a few years ago at Harding University. He's a member of the Church of Christ. He was a member of the West Dallas Church of Christ. And uh, he was shot in his apartment. He was on his couch eating ice cream. Uh, Amber Geiger uh, walked into his apartment, uh, in some way believed that it was her apartment, uh, and ended up shooting him to death in his own apartment. I've wrestled a lot with this whole thing. I've wrestled how to address it, how to talk about it, how to deal with it. Uh, and then this week happened. And some of you have already seen this. We're going to watch the clip in just a minute. Uh, Botham's brother uh, embraces Amber in, in just uh, really something that stirred me. Um, and I want to, before we even go into this, I want you to understand, we're going to talk a little bit about forgiveness today. And we're going to talk about mercy. We're going to talk about grace. God is all those things, and he's passionate about all those things. God is also a God of justice. And as we partner with God, that's the cool thing about being a Christian. I don't, I don't know if we really process this out sometimes, but from the very beginning of time in the garden, you know, God could have made a system of things where everything just worked. He didn't do that. He made a system where man would come in and while we were 
we didn't deserve this, but he said, I want man to partner with me. And he gives man creative responsibilities. I want you to name the animals. I want you to cultivate the ground. And I want you to ultimately make everything around the garden like the garden. He, he, so God brings us in as partners to this. And therefore, if it's important to God, we're a partner in that. And so we're a partner in grace and we're a partner in mercy, but we're also a partner in justice. And I don't want ever... Uh, as we celebrate mercy and grace this morning, I don't want us to, I don't want you to think that I don't believe God's passion about justice. I believe He is. As a matter of fact, if you'll look at what happens within this family, you're going to get different pictures as different people are grieving and handling these things different. And uh, Botham's mother really gives kind of a, another narrative to this whole thing as she deals with this thing. And her father, too. As a matter of fact, they were on Dr. Field this week. I don't know if you saw that. Uh, I don't normally endorse Dr. Phil shows from the pulpit, but uh, I really do think it would be good for you to watch that if you get a chance to. But here's what happened in the courtroom this week. Uh, the sentence was already given out. Everything was already, and these were, I guess you was, they were victim statements, statements from the victim's family. And uh, we're going to play that video. If you haven't watched it already, uh, I think you'll find it impressive. If you have watched it already, uh, as it has me every time I've watched it, I'm touched. So uh, let's watch that together. All right, this is what uh, Brant's dad said about that. He said, I'm not really surprised because we know how we raised him. The Holy Spirit was working. By the way, did you notice how he said, I didn't plan to do this? He felt compelled to do it. Uh, Bertram said, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to become your friend at some point. He's talking about Amber there. 
He said, I have the ability to do it, and I would like to be a friend despite my loss. That's why we are Christians. Now, acknowledging the systemic injustices, and I, I'm passionate about those. You've heard me, if you've been here very long, you've heard me preach on those. I, I believe there are some, some system-based issues that we have that we've got to deal with. But I want us instead this morning to just think about what happened there between two individuals. What happened between someone who was a Christian, and I believe the Holy Spirit was working and active in his life, and what happened between this lady who's just been convicted of murder. I've read a lot this week, a lot of reactions. It almost made me scared to even talk about it at all. Um, but one reaction I saw over and over and over and over is, I could never do that. You know, I would like to think that I could do that. Um, my fleshly part of me, you know, somebody, my brother or my wife or my child, if that happened to me, I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, and that's why. I, it doesn't make sense. And I have no reason to believe that a fleshly person is. And that's why the world didn't understand this. The world didn't understand it at all. Because it was not worldly. I believe there was something divine about what happened there. I think God was working there. And I believe and hope and I pray that we work and, and deal with these systemic issues, but I, I just want to I want to take a minute to, to praise our brother in Christ for taking a moment when he's on a national stage to, to give Jesus to somebody. Uh, you know, there's nobody in this world that doesn't need Jesus. And when you're given a stage and a platform like that, I, I you know, I almost thought about this. I thought about, you know, there could be a day because of what happened in that courtroom that Amber Geiger and both of them Jean meet in heaven. And I got to thinking about, you know, you think about Stephen and when he went out and he, he held the coats, or not Stephen, but Paul, when he went out and held the coats, when Stephen was being stoned. You know, they've been reunited since then. That's cool. That doesn't happen without God. Uh, I think about several other biblical stories where people were wronged or hurt. Or uh, I, I thought about David and Uriah the Hittite. Right, Uriah was wronged in such a powerful way by David, and you know. But I believe that Uriah was a, a faithful person in the kingdom of Israel, and I believe David, uh, despite his sin, is is with God. You know, there's been a reunion of those two people. There's been a reconciliation. That doesn't happen without God. And to the world that watches, it truly is foolishness. Because it's, the world's not expected to look at things the way we Christians look at things. We're called to look at things differently. We're, we're required to look at things differently. We're required to see the least among these. And we're required to look at people and see, you know, God... You know, the world doesn't value this person. The world doesn't value this situation. But I do because I partner with God. And my partnership with God demands it. It requires it. The Corinthian church dealt with a whole lot of division. If you want to read a letter, you know, sometimes we, we have a tendency to be real quick about, well, that's not a church anymore. They've done something we don't like. Uh, let me tell you something. There's a whole lot of churches walking around. That haven't even come close to touching the church at Corinth. God had not given up on them. And he's working to heal a lot of those divisions. And he's working to, to work in those divisions to bring about some peace. And God becomes very... Uh, Jesus, uh, Paul writes here, and it's, it's a very passionate plea about what's about to happen here in the city of Corinth and the church at Corinth and what's happening. And as he really is beginning this first letter, and you know he'll go on to write another one or another letter. And the first letter deals with a whole lot of stuff, a lot of issues within the church, a lot of division in the church, and he really calls them to rally. And we get to Second Corinthians, and we find out 
they fixed some of their problems and they got more problems. And that's church work, by the way. You're going to deal with problems, you're going to have these periods of good, and you're going to deal with problems, and then what's going to happen on the other end, you're going to come out with more problems. Because people are involved, and where people are involved, there's going to be trouble. There's going to be problems. We're going to have to work through things. And it's, it's a struggle, though. And, and Paul's writing there in, in the very beginning of 1 Corinthians, and he's trying to kind of rally them around some things. All right, you're all Christians. You all need to rally around some of these common things. And he brings up this message in 1 Corinthians 1, beginning at verse 18. He says, For the message of the cross... By the way, what you saw happening in that video, that was the gospel. That was the good news. That it doesn't matter what you've done. God's concerned about what you're going to do. So the message of the cross is foolishness for those who are perishing. But to us, but to us who are being saved, it is the, the power of God. It is the powerful working of God. That word for power there, it, it, it has a sense in which it talks about the explosiveness, the overwhelming power of God. You know, the message of the cross does not make sense to the world, but to us that are Christians, to us that are being saved, it makes a whole lot of sense. And it's not because of our logical brain. It's not because we can sit down and write on a piece of paper why this all makes sense. Even though I believe, the, I believe the gospel is logical, but in certain ways when we talk about our fleshly pride, it's counterintuitive. Because it tells us to think less of ourselves and more of others. And that's not what we naturally do. We naturally want to promote ourselves and put others down at the cost of our personal gain. He says, so the gospel of the cross, the good news of the cross, the message of the cross, that's foolishness if you're not a Christian. But for us that do know Christ, for us that are Christ, for us that are seeking to be lights of Christ in this dying, fallen world, it is the power, it's the only thing we lay claim of and lay stake to, it is the power of God. For it is written, he brings up some... An Old Testament passage here, he says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligent of the intelligent, I will frustrate. I'm going to irritate people, and we see this, we saw this recently as we went through the parables that we just went through. They were about Israel, and they were about the frustration that all the leaders in Israel dealt with when they would come to figure out how do we deal with Jesus. He says, I will I will frustrate them because the wisdom that I'm bringing is different than the wisdom that you have naturally. I'm calling you something supernatural. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? In one sense, the message of the cross is foolishness. I mean, let's think about this. We have a God that says, the way I'm going to fix things, I have all power, I can do anything that I want. And he says, the way I'm going to fix things is I'm going to send my only son down to earth to be despised and spit on and throw up on a cross, and he's going to endure pain and suffering, and that's going to fix things. In certain ways, that sounds like foolishness. And if you're just trying to think through this only logically, it's going to seem a little foolish. And that's what, exactly what he's warning about. He's saying it's going to come across as foolishness. But you know, here's the reality. We have an omniscient, omnipotent God who sees things so differently than we see things. And it should not surprise us when what he does is different than what we would do. Because let's just be honest. How many of you, if you had the power to save the world any way you want, the first idea that's going to come to your mind is, well, I need to sacrifice my son. But that's exactly what God did. And in human wisdom, not a lot of sense. But you know what? We believe in a God who sees things and knows things and works things differently than you and me. You know, in certain ways, we'll never come to fully understand all the logic behind it. 
And I've become okay with that. I'm putting my trust in God. That's part of it. Part of it is us learning to trust. And you know, here's the thing. We that are Christians, we believe that in the face of this, it flies in the face of our conventional wisdom. And you know, it's not only conventional wisdom of years gone by. You know, the message of the cross flies in the conventional wisdom of today. It even sometimes flies in front of my conventional wisdom. And the reality is, is I, I got to thinking about this. Sometimes we as Christians do everything we can to like neuter and neutralize the message of the cross. You know, the message of the cross says, you're spitting on me, but I'm going to say, Father, forgive them, for, I don't know, for they don't know what they're doing. You know, that's the message of, of a cross. And sometimes we'll try, try to come up with all sorts of ways where the Bible, you know, it says to turn the other cheek, but it doesn't really mean to turn the other cheek. You know, it, it baffles my mind sometimes when we think about this. Like, we've totally neutered that verse. And we say, well, that doesn't really apply to me in this situation, or this situation, or this situation. It only would apply in this very, very, very specific situation. It's not the gospel. The gospel says you, you look people in, you're, you look your enemies in the face and, and you love them. That's the message of the cross. That's what Jesus did when he sat there. In certain ways, now that I'm a Christian and as I try to grow in my faith, I don't know if there's any other way that I could know the heart of God than through that image. That image of, of a beaten Savior looking out to His enemies. Those who had professed themselves as enemies of Him and the cross that He was on. And they spit and He says, Father, forgive them. I can know the love of God in the cross and in the cross alone. Paul continues on here. For since the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know Him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Man's blindness won't stop God's vision. God will continue to be God no matter what we do or do not do. But you see here what's happening. For those who believe, there, there's an element of what's happening here where, where faith is coming into play. That we're, we're trusting in something we can't quite totally understand. Now we can see the evidence around it, but we, you know, we understand we can't see. I can't see God right now. I can see evidence of God, but I can't see God right now. And here's what's so weird about Christianity. You want to know what's weird about Christianity? Christianity is a religious system in which no person that's a part of the system can boast about anything that we do. Everything a Christian does good should be glory, given glory to God and God alone. When Brant Jean looks at her and says, I forgive you. I, I don't believe that's an accomplishment of Brant Jean. I, I believe it's an accomplishment of the Holy Spirit living in Brant Jean. And I want us to understand that we are a faith system. Christianity is a faith system that finds our salvation not in the work that we do, but rather in putting our trust in the work of the one who has already worked. That's the good news of being saved by grace through faith. We're putting our trust into the work of God, not into our own goodness. Because our own goodness fails over and over and over and over again. You know, my own wisdom in trying to decipher all this this week, it failed over and over and over again. And at some point I was like, all right, you know, not to use an old, wheel, to use an old saying here, Jesus take the wheel, right? I don't understand it all. I'm gonna, I have to put some trust in you. I think we need to address this. I'm going to struggle to address it. But I'm going to put some faith in you that we're going to be okay on the other side of it. You see, in a world that teaches you to pick yourself up by your own bootstraps, Christianity says, that ain't it. That's not it. No, Christianity says, it flies in the face of that wisdom and says, you allow God to pick you up. 
You allow God to move you. You allow God to work in your life. And God will lift you up, not because of something good you've accomplished, but because you've chosen to be the least of these. Because you've chosen to be lesser in this world so that you can be greater in the world to come. I know that when he spoke in that courtroom, there were going to be some people, no matter what he said, that thought what he said was unpopular. And I believe he said it anyway. And I don't view this as somebody who's thinking about all the systems of injustice. I think he's just thinking about, here is a soul that needs Jesus. And he acted. So there were other people that thought this didn't make a whole lot of sense. The Jews, go to the next verse here. The Jews demanded signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we, aren't the Christians, we preach Christ crucified. Now that's a stumbling block to Jews. It's foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. And the weakness of God. By the way, he's using a figure of speech here. There is no weakness of God. But to our minds, he needs to put this in here. For the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. No matter what you think you can accomplish, you can't reach to God's lowest level, and God doesn't have low levels. You'll never get there. You'll, it's never gonna, you're never going to accomplish what you need to accomplish to set everything right, and I believe that's our goal. We're to partner with God and set everything right, but we are never going to get there in our own power. You go back to the beginning. I go back to the... I, I talk about the Garden of Eden all the time. I think it's real important for us to understand this, that that Adam and Eve decided they could do it on their own. Did it work out real well for them? And I'd love to, th- I love to point fingers at Adam and Eve. You know who I don't like to point fingers at? Daniel. But that's who I need to be pointing fingers at. Because here's the reality. I've tried to work things out many times on my own and tried to figure things out and trying to outsmart things and figure out all this stuff. And you know what I find over and over and over again? Not good enough. I can't handle it. See, many Jews, they viewed the crucifixion as like justification for the fact that, that Jesus had been cursed. You, uh, the Old Testament scriptures talk about being cursed on, on the tree. And so they believed that Jesus was being cursed for some sin of his own. Namely, the, the chief priest would have, uh, the chief leaders, the Pharisees, chief priests of the time would have said that he was making himself out to be God, which he was. But he was God, so it was okay. So the Jews, they, sh- they thought the crucifixion proved that Jesus had sin. Now, now, the Greeks, they found all kinds of issues because they dealt with logic and human reasoning. And they found all sorts of issues. That they said, well, that's foolish. There's a God that chooses to suffer? Why would a God choose to suffer? That makes no logical sense. And then they would say, well, well, a criminal Messiah? Really? Your chosen one who's come to save the whole world dies a criminal's death? He's a criminal. He's a condemned criminal. He's a charged and convicted criminal. And so they would try to find ways, using human speculation, to diminish who God was. In this text, real quick, there's three simple ways that people generally reject God, if, if we went back and looked through this, the verse before this, verse 21, people simply reject God outright. You know, we see that in our world, right? We see people who just say there is no God, and, and they don't really want to reason with you about why they believe. They, they said there's no God. I'm going to live for myself. They just reject God. And then there's those that look for God in all the wrong places. That's what the Jews did. They had God sitting right in front of them and they hung him on a cross. And they said, we need to see more miracles, more signs. No, show us more, more, more. Make us powerful. That's what the Jews said. And then you've got the Greeks over here. So you've got people that just reject God. You've got people who look for God in all the wrong places. And then you've got the Jews that are trying to find, make God into their own image. If God was smart, he would do things our way. God doesn't work or operate on our wisdom. So I want to be clear to you. 
the next time anybody comes to you and says, you know, Christianity just does not make a lot of sense. It's not supposed to make sense to them. It's not supposed to make sense to the world. You know, because this is not a, a logic thing. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not anti-intellectual. I, I'm anti-intellectual if it's not gospel-centered. But I'm not anti-intellectual. I, I believe we need people who continue to reason and study and grow in the Scriptures and bring that in front of people. I wholeheartedly believe that. I'm not anti-intellectual. But I am anti-intellectual if it's not centered in faith. If it's not centered in acknowledging that there is something greater than me, I don't want part of that intellectualism. It's not supposed to make sense to the world. But to us, to us who are Christians, Jesus on the cross is showing our total reversal of all logic. And he's saying now the least are going to become the greatest. We as Christians understand that, and it makes no sense to the world. But for us, that's the good news. The good news is you don't have to be a somebody. God doesn't even want you to be a somebody. God calls nobodies. And you're a nobody, and I'm a nobody. And if we can be nobodies, one day God will make us somebody. The gospel, in the face of hurt, and pain, and struggle, we declare that we're part of a kingdom that's greater than this one. We declare that we are part of a kingdom that will never fail. We declare that we are part of a kingdom that will never fall. We live in light of the gospel, not because of our goodness, but because of God's. And may God be glorified in our actions. And when the spotlight is put on us. May we not take the time for personal vengeance. And by the way. If Brant in that moment. I, I want to be clear. And I know some people may say what happened there. And maybe you're one of those. Hear what I'm telling you. Bitterness will eat you alive. And he could have walked around with bitterness. Threat. What happened there was just. I mean it healed him. Bitterness will eat you alive. And that's not what human logic says. Human logic says, I can never forgive that person. But he chose a greater portion. He chose a better person. He said, I'm not going to walk around the rest of my life with this kind of bitterness when I've got a God that loves me and a God that's already healed my brother, and one day he's going to heal me too. That's the gospel. That's the good news. May every day we walk out the doors of our homes waiting for the moment, waiting for the moment that the spotlight's put on us and we said, I don't want the spotlight. Give it to God. Let's pray. God, you are powerful beyond power. You are majesty beyond any majesty we can know in this world. You are the Christ, the Messiah. You are the Father. You are the Son. You are the Holy, sweet Spirit. You are the suffering Messiah. Not a Messiah that came to relate to the royals and the elites, but rather you came to relate to the lowly. And sometimes, God, we're not lowly, and we struggle to relate to you because we think too much of ourselves. May we repent. May we turn our focus and our portion to you. May we give glory to you and you alone. Through the cross we pray. Amen. This is your family. And we're called to do this thing together. We're called to struggle through it together. Uh, I just want to make a special plea to you this morning. And you don't have to do it up here. Um, I want to make a, a special plea that we as a church are... We, we want to move somewhere. We want to go somewhere. But too frequently, the bitterness that happens in each of our lives, my life, your life, every life, sometimes it holds us back from being who we need to be. Um, some of you have got hurts in here that are 20, 30, 40 years old that you've probably never gotten rid of. You don't have to walk around with that. You don't have to walk around with it. I just want to make a plea to you this week to... 
to let go. It's okay to let go. It's okay to let God rule and work and it not have to be about your, your bitterness anymore. Let me tell you something. I believe God will work in powerful ways when His people find freedom. True freedom. Freedom that doesn't listen to all the wisdom of the intellectuals of the world. But rather we listen to the wisdom of our God. Maybe you've got some kind of public hurt and you need, you're just struggling. You, you've tried to give it up and you just can't. Well, you know, that's where God uses some different things. He'll use His Word to convict you and He'll use the Spirit that lives in you to convict you and He'll use other people that surround you to convict you. And Maybe you're at the point where you need the people around you to embrace you and love you and hug you. I want to encourage you. I want to encourage this church. If When you've got somebody, we've got somebody coming forward down here. Uh, nobody needs to come forward alone. Okay? Uh, this is a, a family. This is not a walk of sin or shame. When, somebody walk, when somebody's willing to walk down in front of 150 other people to say, I need help, they're hurting. And do you know what Christians are called to do for hurting people? Anybody? Help, comfort, heal, work with them, be the face. So I want to encourage you, anytime we have somebody come forward, come, somebody, we need other people down here with them. We need down here, people down here surrounding, surrounding them. And it may, you may say, well, I've never done that before. Okay. Start today. But if you're struggling or you're hurting, or if Jesus' story has never been your story, what, what better day to make it your story? The, the story of, of a God who enters into destruction and He comes out in you and we do the same thing. We, we're baptized into Christ. We, we go enter into His death and we rise in resurrection. It's, it's a powerful, powerful thing to be a Christian. If you've got any of those needs, we want to be your family this morning. We want to surround you. We want to love you. We want to hug on you. We want to, we want to tell you, you know, you're not alone in this thing. If you've got a need of this church, let us help. Let us know while we'll stand together and while we'll sing a song.